let me start with a question about our personality. Are you introverted or extroverted? I know this question might be too simple if we try to put everyone into only these two categories. Everyone has and everyone needs both introverted side and extroverted side. In our spiritual life, we also need both experiences and practices in our community and also in our personal devotions. We need companies to walk with and at the same time, we need a time of solitude to deepen our faith. As we usher in the season of Lent this week, we want to be intentional in making spaces with God and for God toward Easter. Sometimes I wonder, is he faithful? Does he see me in my trouble? Does he understand? Sometimes I question if he's able Can he rescue, can he save me again and again When I look back Did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he did So yes, he can Did he defeat the darkness? Sometimes those voices try to tell me I'm forgotten and I'm falling too far from his hands But I know what kind of God he is And I'm trusting in his promises I'm believing and I'm singing Yes, he can Did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he seen too much now I can't deny he's come through every single time from the beginning until the end he did he will he can Ooh. did he move every mountain did he part every sea Jesus 
Jesus, we do trust in Jesus. You can take him at his word. Never ending, sweet surrender. It gets better as we go. Always the right time to call on his name when you're rejoicing, when you're repaying, when you feel lost, show you the way. Hello and welcome to our online service today on this first weekend of Lenten season, a season of preparation toward Easter. We are very grateful for each of you to worship with us whenever or wherever you may be. If we are searching for a community of faith to belong to, please let us know you are here with us by using our online connect card. The link can be found on our now page, headoffieldemc.org slash now. And this is where you can find all the resources and the ways to get involved in the life of the church, including weekly bulletin and connect guide. Please check this page out when you are available. I want to highlight our offering of a brief month support group led by Reverend Kathy Morris. She is a certified brief month counselor and spiritual director, and this class is offered especially for those who have experienced the loss in the last two years. This is in person class offered for six to eight weeks. And if you are interested in this class or if you want to sign up, please contact to our church office at office at headonfieldemc.org. To make a space with God and for God in this season of Lent, we want to offer a Wednesday contemplative prayer meeting at 7 o'clock for anyone who needs quiet time and space for prayers. This will be hosted in our Brown Chapel, opening with singing and scripture reading and communal prayers. And the space will be open for a personal prayer. And anyone is welcome to join us to deepen your faith in this season of Lent. I want to express my deep gratitude to anyone and everyone who have shared your resources with us through your generous giving. Your giving enables our ministries possible for all people as we build up a loving and co welcoming community with each other. And I know your giving comes with your big heart, big loving heart for God and for others. And I know it's your expression of your faith. So please continue to partner with us in ministry through your generous giving as we worship together. You can make the relief effort for people in Turkey and Syria who are experiencing a crisis from the unexpected earthquake and by selecting the fund on our online giving. And you can give online anytime at headonfieldemc.org slash give or you can text the word give to the number on your screen or you can mail a check to the church office. And before we invite Pastor Chris for the message, would you please join your heart with mine in prayer? 
loving and gracious God, we are so grateful for who you are and whose we are. We are grateful for this special season of Lent, inviting us to come closer to you. Oh Lord, we open up our hearts and mind and we create the space with you and for you in this season. Oh Lord, let us experience your goodness and your faithfulness day by day and let us grow in our faith deeply and widely. We pray that you may pour out your spirit of love and compassion in our hearts. You may pour out your spirit of peace on the earth. Oh Lord, have mercy on us and listen to our prayers of heart. Release your grace of healing and compassion and reconciliation as we continue to worship together in this space. We lift up our spoken and unspoken prayers in the name of Jesus, who loves us more than we can imagine. Amen. Life can get pretty cluttered. We acquire stuff, we get busy, and after a while, we find we have little time to do what we want and little room to breathe. In the busyness and crowdedness of daily life, we can lose a sense of God's presence and direction. This Lent, join us as we seek to declutter our lives and find ways to reconnect with God in simplicity, nature, relationships, and letting go of stuff. Making Spaces Hi there. The scripture I'd like to read today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly Angels came and waited on him. Well, this is the first weekend in the season of Lent. Lent is a period of 40 days that leads up to Easter, 40 days with not counting the Sundays. And so as we begin this season each year, we usually start with this story of Jesus going into the wilderness for 40 days, fasting, for a period of clarity and this season in his life, this time in the wilderness, comes between his baptism in which God claims Jesus as God's beloved and then Jesus' world earthly ministry. And so we're going to reflect a little bit about this period of 40 days, particularly Jesus fasting and discerning in the wilderness. I want to first talk a little bit about clutter. I cannot stand clutter. Clutter clutters my thinking. It prevents me from being creative and really getting things done. If I sit at a messy desk or in a messy house, my head is full of the same sort of clutter. And yet, I seem to accrue clutter always, in all seasons of my life, little by little by little, till I get to a point where I can't think anymore. But I recently read that even Marie Kondo, who is famous for her own organizational method of helping people completely declutter their lives, even Marie Kondo has given up on completely decluttering. Well, she recently had her first child, 
And she said that she practiced the KonMari method, which she has taught in her Netflix specials, her books, her TED Talks, her consulting. The KonMari method encourages people to bring, to gather all their possessions in different categories, one at a time, and, and to hold an item and ask, does it spark joy? And if it does not spark joy, simply to get rid of it. And it is a way to simplify, to declutter, and to really clarify your life and reduce the amount of stuff. But she said when she had her first child, um, it just was almost impossible with all of the things you have to have for a kid and the toys and the accoutrements and the carrying things. And she just said that she's going easy on herself now in this period of life so that she can focus her attention on being with her child and being with her family. Even the guru of decluttering has acknowledged the limitations of decluttering our lives. A number of years ago, when I was working full-time as a director of communications, I dealt a lot in paper. We would be working on designing things, flyers and magazines and articles and ads, all promoting mission in the United Methodist Church. But every single day, I would accrue more paper. Someone would print something out and ask my opinion on it, or I would have to create another draft or another proof or write something. And so day by day, week by week, I would accrue more and more paper. And what often would happen is I would get to a breaking point, which I could not work in my office. I would have to leave and go somewhere else because I couldn't think with all the clutter in my office. And usually it would take a few months, if not a season, until finally I would break down and either come in on a Saturday or stay till eight or nine or 10 o'clock and just purge the whole office. I remember a couple of times when my desk got so bad, and I mean, so bad. The paper was was piled four feet high on top of the desk. I couldn't even get to my desk from the door because of all the paper and the, and the folders and the books and the magazines. Sometimes it got so bad that my colleagues had mercy and pity on me and they would stay with me into the night and help me to sort through the papers and throw it away. And of course, when I purged the office, it looked amazing. I felt good. And what happened? I vowed never to let my desk get that cluttered again. And it worked, usually for about five months until I had to go through the whole cycle again. That's kind of what Lent is like sometimes in our own spiritual lives. We can get to the point where we accrue baggage. We accrue the dust of a difficult winter. We can accrue the stuff in our lives where we find that it is hard to be present with God. We find that it is hard to even connect with God or hard to pray or hard to find clarity in our lives. Because just like my desk or just like our homes or our spaces, when we accrue clutter in our own spiritual lives, we find it hard to feel God's presence. We find it hard to slow down enough because we're so busy. We have no margin in our lives. We have no space where we can find the clarity that we need. And I find usually in these times where I'm just so busy and my mind and spirit are so cluttered, I just don't know how to get out of the funk. Well, enter in this beautiful and powerful text. Jesus walks away from it all. He most likely has been a disciple of his cousin, John, who was most likely a member of the ascetic group, the Essenes. The Essenes lived in the Dead Sea area, and they lived away from society, and they were in an order, um, think a monastic order, living out God's covenant, because they felt that the Jews living in Jerusalem, in the holy city, were not holding up to God's covenant. So they were living strictly by the covenant of Moses, believing that God would bring them salvation. And so John goes in from the wilderness, goes into the northern region in Galilee, and is preaching repentance to turn away from breaking the covenant of God, it invites everyone to live into God's reign again, to be in right relationship with God. So Jesus joins John's group and asks John to baptize him 
But then it becomes clear that Jesus has a ministry of his own. So to clarify his own purpose, to clarify his own intentions, and to really separate the life before and the life after, Jesus himself leaves society, leaves his family, and he goes most likely from the Galilee region, which is in the northern part of what is today Israel, and which was the, the former kingdom of Israel. He goes the whole way down, most likely by the Dead Sea area, which is south of Jerusalem. And it is there that Jesus is by himself for this extended period of time. He fasts and he prays. And then we see, first it says the tempter, and which is the, the true definition of the word Satan in Hebrew, which means the adversary. So it says the tempter, most likely the Hebrew word hasatan, the Satan. And then it says the devil, which is a more modern comes concept of Satan. But however you define it, the tempter shows up and begins to tempt Jesus as he in the, is in that space, trying to lean on God and to simplify so that he can feed on that relationship to clarify his own life and his own calling before he goes into ministry. And there are these three temptations. Of course, um, every temptation that is offered to him, Jesus refutes by quoting Hebrew scriptures. And often even the devil quotes Hebrew scriptures. And it's this sparring match a little bit of scripture for scripture. But Jesus justifies his not giving in to temptation because he is rooted and grounded in his understanding of, of Scripture and in his relationship with God. As I look at these three temptations, I see in them relevant temptations for us, particularly when we want to clarify or to purge in our lives, to get rid of the clutter, to um, immerse ourselves in our spiritual life. I find that there are often three temptations. One is to meet our own hunger or to satisfy our own hungers. I long for things and you long for things in, in life, for purpose, for meaning, for relationship, for connectivity. And it is very real for us to want to seek out the answers ourselves to decide what will fill that hole and that space in our life. And one of the ways that we our lives get overpacked and overcluttered is that we constantly feel like, oh, well, if I just do this, then, then I'll be happy. If I, well, oh, they want me to help here, and maybe then I'll feel satisfied. And so we add to our calendars, we add to our life, we add to the busyness because we're trying to fill a hunger. But what Jesus says, he reminds us, is that only God provides. Only God can fill that deep desire and longing and hunger in our lives. And if we can stop trying to fill it with busyness and stuff, and, and immerse ourselves in simplicity in which we can experience God, only there will we ever really find satisfaction for what we desire the most. Number one, we're tempted to meet our own hunger. Number two, we overestimate our own importance, right? The, the devil says to Jesus, throw yourself down, and the scripture says, if you are the Messiah, that you are, God will save you. You are indispensable to God. And Jesus reminds the devil that we are not to tempt God. And I find that the temptation, I have the same temptation, is that it's hard for me to step away and to simplify my life and to spend time doing the things I need to do to tend my spirit. Because the temptation is for me to overestimate my importance. Maybe you have wondered before, how would they ever live without me, right? How would, if I don't do it, everything's going to fall apart. If I'm not home, the kids, the, the kids will, they won't get to school. They won't, you know, if I'm not at work, they can't live without me. And we have this overflated sense of self and self-importance that we feel that we have to save and do. And while you are important, all of us are replaceable in one way or another in a sense that nothing is more important on our connecting with God. And what Jesus says to the devil, his answer is that humans are human and God is God. We shall not tempt God because only God is in control and we are not divine. 
the devil is trying to get Jesus to lean into his divinity, but Jesus is fully human and he knows that we are not to tempt God. The third temptation I find that I often wrestle with, and I, th I think you might as well, is the desire to have and the desire to be in control. And so this is the final temptation the devil says to Jesus as he takes him to one of the highest places. Look at all of this land. Look at that city. See the lights? See the fire over there? See the temple? I can put you in charge. You just have to worship me. And Jesus says, we are to only worship God, not our desire to have or whatever it takes to be in control. And I find that our own temptation is to like trying to fill the hole with busyness, saying, oh, well, if I just had this, right, I just got that thing, you know, maybe I'll stop being so restless in life. Or maybe the problem is that they're doing it wrong and I just need to find a way to be in control, to be in power. This time in the wilderness helps Jesus, before he goes into ministry, helps him to let go of the illusion that control will ever be satisfied. The reality is, is if we desire control, that desire is never quenched. We will never be happy. We will always want more and more and desire to be in control of more and more. And so Jesus, for us, debunks this myth and helps us to claim that biblical truth, which is that we are to worship God alone. And that's really just an acknowledging that no matter how much in control we may feel when we lose a loved one or when we get a tough diagnosis, or when we get a tough life situation change, it snaps us back to reality. We never really were in control in the first place. We worship God who created the heavens and the earth and the universe, and God gives us our life. And for that, we worship God. So how do we create such a simple place or place a simplicity in our lives so that we can let go of these temptations and, and get in tune with our good God, to declutter ourselves. So just like there are three temptations, I think there are three solutions or three possible solutions to these. Number one, in these 40 days, I encourage you to take daily sips. If you are completely parched, if you are really thirsty, you can never fill your thirst in one drink. And I find just like when my desk was just, it was you know massive, I couldn't clean the clutter by spending 15 minutes. I had to take six hours to clean the cl clutter. In the same way, if instead I had at the end of every day thrown away the papers from that day, I wouldn't have accrued that clutter. So in the same way, if we are hungry and if, if we are tired, if our spirit is fatigued or worn out, find a way to take daily sips, little sips. One of the practice I, practices I've been doing this year is that as often as I can, almost every day, I take a walk and I'll find a bench somewhere and I set a timer, depending on the day, either 10, 15, 20, or 25 minutes. And I will meditate and pray. And when that timer goes off, I say amen, and I get up and I go about my way because I don't have to drink the ocean in one sitting. I need little sips every day of prayer and of contemplative uh, meditation that helps me to settle in to God's presence and to let go of the clutter little by little. So take daily sips to fill your hunger and thirst through regularly drinking in God's presence. And in the same way, daily reading of scripture, things that just little bits that can put you in the way of God's presence. The second is create margin in your life. This is the most important and perhaps the hardest thing for us to do. One of the reasons we can feel out of touch with God is that we never stop and we never have space to do the things that we want to do or to think or to pray or to read or to breathe. And usually it's because we suffer from that temptation that if I don't get it done, bad things are going to happen. And the reality is, is that if you don't maintain your spirit life, bad things are going to happen. Just like if you don't maintain your physical life, 
bad things are going to happen. And it's more important to create margin than it is to try and save every situation you find yourself in. Remember that second temptation is to overestimate our, our importance. Oh, the world's going to fall apart if I don't do X, Y, and Z. Well, guess what? You are going to fall apart if you don't maintain your spirit life. So create margin, margin in your life. The world will not end if you do not do everything today. And the third is reflect on the goodness of God every day. I, I've found this to be a very, very important um, discipline, which is simply as a part of my prayer and meditation, is to worship God in daily gratitude and praise. Even in difficult times, I think, what about the situation is good? Where has God shown up, even when things haven't gone, as I, as I think? And I'll, in every case, I can always find a glimpse of goodness. When I was fatigued and burned out and tired, I couldn't because I was trying to drink the ocean. But day by day, if I look at every situation, I can see the people around me, the gifts that I have, daily reflect on the goodness of God so we can stop worshiping our desire to have more and to control more. God created everything. God is in control, and our job is to live in, in God's goodness here on earth. So friends, don't squander the season of Lent. Don't just sit back and treat it like any other time. You have this built-in season in which the world is changing. Winter is turning into spring. Winter is purging and cleansing. The dirty, dusty, dreary of December and January is being cleansed to spring forth in beauty. So why don't you purge some of the clutter in your life, the dust, and seek to intentionally engage with God this season. What do you want to give up? What are some things you want to let go of? The early Methodists fasted every Wednesday. I'm going to try and limit my, my eating to one meal every Wednesday. As, just as an act of simplicity. That is an ancient practice. It's also a modern practice if you follow intermittent fasting. But whatever it is. What is a way that you can simplify, clear out, so that you can take sips, drink in God's goodness, pray, heal, and grow? Find ways to drink in small sips of God's presence. Create margin in your life. Reflect on the goodness of God. Create space for God, and God will bless you this season of Lent. I'm grateful that you are traveling and journeying with me at Haddonfield United Methodist Church. I encourage you to share our service with friends and family, and I'll look forward to connecting with you virtually or in person. Take care and God bless. Keep following Jesus